Good evening all, and welcome to Creepy Pasta Collections. Today I bring you a host of stories for your listening pleasure, featuring the amazing talents of Sinister Grave. So get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. Lucas Williams stares out at the double doors, a smile on his face, but a burning hatred in his heart. He had been working as a bellhop for many years now, and the job had worn down what little patience and sanity the man had left. His life had grown meaningless, with no family or friends. Even things he used to enjoy as a young man grew to nothing more than a burden. New guests piled their way into the hotel, continuing the monotonous chain of events that plagued his everyday life. The only thing he had going for him was a pack of cigarettes and a view of the city from the rooftop of the hotel. If only his guests could see the pain in the man's eyes, they could have prevented what had been laying dormant. The thing he had been trying to ignore for so long had finally arisen once more. The urge to end it all. To just leap off the building and say goodbye. After taking care of the guests, he climbs up to the roof to smoke, thinking of doing just that. The moonlight shone across the pavement below, and Lucas lets out a big sigh. He was nearly an old man, his once black hair already beginning to grey, and the light from his brown eyes beginning to fade. He raises a foot to the edge, as if in slow motion, but something seems to stop him. A loud scream coming from the floor below him pulled him out of his thoughts. He turned around, in shock and surprise, running back towards the stairs. The only thought going through his head was that there was no way that someone could be on this floor, as it had been closed for renovations. He looked around the long, eerie corridor, searching for the source of the cry. The scream returns once more, this time sending a chill down his spine, as he realises the room was right beside where he was standing. He slowly turns to the door, nervously reaching a hand towards it. He clutches the door handle and slowly pulls it open, the sight inside horrifying him to his core. An empty room, void of light, that's what met his eyes. He slowly stepped into the room, looking around to see nothing that could have made the noise. I was sure it was coming from here, he thought to himself. As he turns to walk out of the room, the door slams shut behind him, locking him inside. He frantically tries to pull at the door handle, but it wouldn't budge. He could hear the dark laughter of a man coming from behind him. Before he could turn around, he could practically feel the breath on the back of his neck. Lucas snaps out of his stupor, and turns around violently to confront the person. But nothing stood behind him. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw what appeared to be someone standing by a window. He turns more fully, to see a young woman leaning halfway out the open window. A white gown, flowing slightly in the breeze. Before he could run towards her, she fell forwards falling seemingly to her death with a loud pitched scream, like that that he'd heard earlier. He run towards the woman, in shock, but when he reaches the window, there was nothing on the ground below. He heard the same man's laughter from before, and one final sentence before he followed the woman's fate. Let's give you a little push of motivation, shall we? What Lucas would never have known was what truly happened in that room many years ago. A young woman was trying to get away from her abusive boyfriend, finally, by jumping off the roof. But after not being able to gain the courage, 
She goes down and returns to her room, and opens the window to get some fresh air. It seemed that her lover had found her, and decided to give her a bit of assistance by pushing her out the window, before pulling a gun out of his pants and ending his own life as well. If Lucas had just quit like he wanted to, he would have never ended up this way. But sometimes, what you don't know can kill you. On the last day of school, five friends named Axel, Max, Jane, Fred, and John planned to have a night out while they're still on summer break. They insisted to have a camping trip beside Axel's house since there are nearby forests at the back of their house. Max being the oldest and somewhat leader of the group gave everyone assignments on what to bring that day. Feeling all excited, everyone got home from school and started to prepare and buy things that they would need to bring out to camp. Finally, the day came of the camp out. The doorbell rang and Axel opened the door, and then came in Fred and John with the tent and sleeping bags. A few minutes later, Max rang the doorbell to greet everyone with drinks that he was tasked to bring. All that was left was Jane. <sighs> As always, Jane is late again, <laughs> said Max. Everyone giggled and agreed with him because it was really always her that was always late. Maybe we could call her and let her know that we're all here, added Fred. All right, I'll, I'll call her, answered John. Just as he was about to press the call button, a message popped out. It's Jane saying, Hey guys, I'll be there in a second, I'm just picking up snacks. The group then decided to wait. A few minutes later, Jane came ringing the bell. Hi guys, sorry I'm late again. I passed through an accident earlier that caused traffic jams explained Jane. <laughs> it's okay, don't worry, we're uh, used to you being late, answered John, teasing Jane. <laughs> all right, we're all set. Uh, I think it's time to go camping now. What do you guys say? Said Max. The group grabbed their stuff and went through the back of Axel's house. As they went through the forest, everyone felt a strange feeling as if someone or something was following them. Max then decided to tell jokes to cheer everyone up. As always, Max got everyone to laugh and got them to tell funny stories that they had. But while kidding around, Max stepped on a giant rock trying to balance himself with one leg, but unfortunately failed and slipped. He plunged right into a puddle beside the giant rock. Everyone then laughed for a second and then helped Max out. Good thing I brought extra shorts. <laughs> Max kidded. As they continued further, Fred noticed Jane. Hey Jane, uh, you, uh, are you okay? You seem a little pale, said Fred. Jane just nodded and faced Fred with a smile. Oh, well, okay then. Just, uh, tell us if something's wrong, alright? Don't worry, we're not mad at you for being late, added Fred, and he smiled back. Thanks, Fred. I'm all right. Don't worry, answered Jane. As they reached a great campsite, they fixed up the tents and campfire. Max pulled out the drinks from his bag. Everyone circled around the campfire and started roasting marshmallows. John then said, What about a ghost story to light up the mood? Are you guys in? Smirked John as he looked at everyone else. Okay. One ghost story won't harm. Besides, I mean, we're, we're near Axel's house, smiled Max. Everyone laughed and agreed. Then John started his ghost story. A long time ago, some said that there was a ghost that lived in this very forest named Exemplum that mostly disguised itself as someone's companion. That ghost tricks a lot of travelers and campers, believing that they are with the person that they were entering the forest with. It can copy any person, or even an animal. They said that you must not get convinced by her, because if you ever leave this forest with that ghost, it will pull you back inside the forest, and you will never be seen again. Everyone looked at each other, creeped out from the story. Fred then whispered to John, Hey, do you think Jane is exemplum? 
She's been acting weird ever since we got in the forest. John's eyes opened wide and was shocked of what Fred said. They both stared at Jane. Axel, just beside John, heard the conversation and added, You know what? You may be right. She was the last one to come earlier. The trio started to get suspicious of Jane, while the others wondered what the three of them were talking about. Hey guys, uh, you want to share something with us? You seem to be whispering about something, asked Max. John looked at Max and gave him a gesture to come by their side, but Max refused and said, What? No, I, I, I don't want to. If you're going to tell me something, why don't you tell it in front of all of us? The three of them looked at each other, then Axel spoke up. Okay. We think that Jane is exemplum. What? Yelled Max and Jane. Axel, why'd you tell him? Said Fred. What? Max asked. Besides, I think they need to know. Answered Axel. Guys, don't tell me you guys believe in that story. <laughs> oh, come on. Really, guys? <laughs> Max added, laughing. Fred and John just laughed it off, saying, <laughs> We're just messing with you, Jane. We thought of that because you've been looking serious ever since we got here. Is there something wrong? I just feel something's not right. I apologize if I brought down your mood. Don't worry, I'll cheer up smiled Jane. Well, that's settled then. Let's start to have fun. Drinks are here, said Max, while raising beer bottles up in the air. The group continued the laughter and the fun they had. Jane then later told everyone she would be back. She just needs to use the bathroom. A few minutes later, Axel also excused herself. A few long minutes later, just when the boys realized Jane and Axel were taking too long, the three boys left behind heard a scream from the trees. They saw Axel running back as quick as she could and was gasping for air. She reached the campsite and hurriedly said, I saw Jane, Jane floating in front of a giant tree and speaking some kind of, some kind of language. It's weird, Axel said cryingly. She seemed to be casting a spell. Or something, and the tree started to die as the leaves started falling down too, added Byer. Everyone looked at each other in shock. What? Are, are you sure? Aren't you just drunk from all the booze we drank? Fred said. I'm sure of what I saw. If you don't believe me, you can go back and look for yourself, Axel said angrily. Well, okay, uh, l l let's go all together, Fred said. Everyone agreed. They took their flashlights, and as they reached the middle part of the forest, Axel pointed out to a tree where she claimed to see Jane floating. The tree was completely lifeless from the others. Its leaves were all gone, and the color is pale as black. As they were looking at the tree, one of the branches started to fall, causing them to scream in surprise. All of a sudden, someone from behind them said, Hey guys. Everyone then screamed again and faced the sound of the voice with their flashlights pointing at the bottom of the tree. They started to raise their lights slowly and they trembled down as they saw a ghostly figure smiling at them. And then the figure started to float, ready to charge. Everyone fled in terror, screaming, Go! Go back to the campsite! Keep running! Keep running! Unfortunately, as they were running in terror, they got separated from each other. Fred and Max went running on the right side of the forest, Axel by herself in the middle, and John by himself on the left side. While Fred and Max were running, they can still hear the voice of the ghost maniacally laughing. The two hurried and ran as quick as possible and found themselves at the campsite. A few minutes later came John and Axel, both gasping for air. <sighs> See, I told you, I told you, Axel said while catching her breath. We told you guys, we told you that Jane was exemplum, added Fred and John. Everyone is still catching their breath. 
All right, fine. Jane is exemplum. What do we do now? All we have to do is just get out of the forest without her, right? Added Max. Well, that's what the story said, answered John. Can it harm us or do anything to us? Asked Axel. I don't, I don't know. I thought it was only a myth, shakingly answered by John. Everyone stared at each other and became confused on what to do next. Why don't we ask for help instead, said Fred. Yeah, you're right. We could use our phones, John said. Uh, guys, my, my phone's not here. I, 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 I left it here earlier, though, said John, while turning over almost everything to look for his phone. Ours are missing as well, responded Max while checking his pockets. Maybe we, we dropped it while we were running, added Axel. Oh, never mind the phones. Let's just get out of this forest and ask for help from my house, said Axel, inviting them to get the hell out of there. <laughs> <laughs> A maniacal laugh got everyone staring at the trees, scared of what they heard. They huddled into one place looking in every direction, looking for the source of that sound. Axel stood up and said, Come on guys, let's get out of here, while waving her hands. In panic, everyone hurriedly got up and went to leave the forest as one group forming a line with Max in the front. The cold breeze made everyone shiver more. The laughing continued. The longer they were walking, the louder the laugh got. Then, everyone was shocked when they heard Fred scream from behind. Everyone looked at him and pointed their flashlights. Fred was on the ground gasping for air. What? 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 What is it, Fred? John said. I felt something touch me, answered Fred, pointing in the direction from behind. Everyone in fear, raising their flashlights, were on Fred and where he was pointing, and where exactly he was pointing, was a tree branch just right on his level. <laughs> it was only a tree branch, Fred. You gave us the creeps. They helped Fred stand up in relief and continued to walk. As they continued, they heard Jane's voice calling out their names. Max! Max! Hey guys, do you hear that? Max said. I think it's Jane's voice. She must be somewhere in the forest, said Fred. John! John! Calling again. We should go look for her, added Max. I don't think we should, replied John. Why not? Axel asked. Remember my story. The exemplum will try anything to convince us to get it out of the forest with us, answered John. I suppose you're right. Could we ask for help finding her if we get out safely? Come on, guys, and just ignore it, said Max. Guys! Guys, where are you? Guys! The calling continued. The group ignored the calling while they were continuing walking until it was just dead silent again. But suddenly, they saw Fred quickly dash in front of everyone, shaking in fear. Whoa, 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 what is it again? Said Max. Someone grab me from behind. Whatever you do, whatever you do, don't look behind. Answered Fred, visibly shaking. Everyone, terrified and scared of looking back, remembered what happened earlier to Fred with the branch. Curiosity got the best of them, and they turned around to check it out. As they slowly turned around, they instantly regretted the move they made. They saw Fred. Fred is standing right there looking at them in confusion on why they turned around. He then noticed someone from behind Max, smiling. He slowly stepped back in shock as he saw the thing from behind slowly growing bigger into a shadowy form. 
I told you not to look behind. <laughs> Said by the thing behind them in a deep, heavily voice. Every one of them had goosebumps that faced the thing behind them. And they began to scream. La! Run! Run! In panic again, every one of them ran into different directions. They didn't mind where they went, they just kept running just to get away from the creature thing. Coincidentally, Max and Axel were running away and they bumped into each other and tripped on the puddle where Max fell down earlier. Ow! My head! Max said, rubbing his forehead. Clearing his eyes with the puddled water, he saw Axel also in pain, touching her arm. Axel! I'm so glad I saw you. I'm sorry for bumping into you. Don't worry, this is the puddle where I slipped on earlier. It means that we're almost out of the forest, explained Max. Axel was still in pain. I'm really sorry. You can rest here for a while and wait for the others to come, said Max. Axel leaned on the giant rock while Max peeped to see if John and Fred were around, but then hit again when he heard the maniacal laughing from the trees. Meanwhile, John, scared for his life, managed to get himself cut by branches as he tripped over an overgrown root on his way out in panic. He then saw an arrow pointing to the right way of getting out. He hurried and ran towards it, but suddenly, someone grabbed him from behind and covered his mouth. <coughs> John forced him to speak and to get loose. Shh, shh, shh. It's me. It's Fred, said Fred, whispering. John looked at Fred in relief and calmed down. <sighs> Why did you pull me down? The exit's right there, John said in a whispering but angry voice. Look. John pointed to the tree behind the arrow where the creature is lurking. I think that thing knew that someone would go past through there and is just waiting to attack someone, said Fred. Yeah, you're probably right. Thanks there, bud, said John as he tapped Fred's shoulder. No problem, man. What happened to you? You're bleeding everywhere, added Fred. <laughs> I got cut by branches and I tripped over some roots. No biggie, answered John. Well, okay, well, we, we better get out of here and get those cleaned. Look, I found their phones in some of the bushes. Sadly, all, all of them don't have a signal, said Fred. That won't be any use for us now. We can go, we can go around the other way to avoid that thing, said John. All right, let's go, Fred said. They both moved slowly on the other side of the forest, trying not to make any noise to attract anything. Hey, John, John, there's a giant rock in the puddle from earlier where Max slipped. It's almost near the exit. We, we can go there, said Fred. They both ran as fast as they could, as they heard something calling them again from behind. As they reached the rock, Max popped out and gave everyone a shock. Whoa, 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 whoa. Everyone screaming in surprise, but they calmed down as they familiarized each other. Max, Axel, you're here, thank goodness, said John. The call grew louder, and everyone looked at each other. Come on, guys. We have to leave. We have to leave now. I think... I think it heard our screams, said Axel. Everyone stood up, held hands, and ran as quick as they could as they saw Axel's house. Everyone, we're almost there. We're almost there, said Max, leading the way. They pushed the gate real hard as if escaping from a burning house. They made it. We did it. We did it, said Fred, in relief as they all lied on the grass at Axel's house. Max! Guys! A familiar voice called them from the house. Everyone stared at each other, confused and in fright. They then slowly looked at the house and saw Jane coming out from the back door. Guys, where have you been? said Jane. In fright, the group backed away from her, cowering by the gate. 
Oh, what's wrong with you guys? Why are you all so dirty? Asked Jane in confusion. You're, you're a ghost. Stay back. Stay away from us, said Fred. What are you guys talking about? Asked Jane. We saw you floating and chasing us. Stay back, added John. What? I've been looking for you guys this whole night inside the forest. I saw your things, but never saw any of you. I was calling your names, but no one answered. I returned back to the house because I thought you guys were missing with me, explained Jane. Wait, so you never saw and heard anything? Any creatures or screams? Asked Max. No, nothing. I walked straight back here and then Axel greeted me back. Jane answered. Wait, 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 who? Axel greeted you back? But she's been with us the whole time, answered Max. No, nothing. I walked straight back here, then Axel greeted me, Jane answered. Wait, 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 who? Axel greeted you back? But she was with us the whole time, answered Max. Are you guys all right? I was calling you guys earlier because I saw Axel back here at her house and she said she won't be able to come back. She received a call that her brother was in the hospital so she went there quickly. She said she messaged every one of us and she had to go and leave us with the maid for a while. Jane explained in confusion of what they said. Come to think of it, we never actually saw Jane float and do that doohickey thing. We only saw a dead tree, Max said as he realized. Yeah. But how do you explain Axel being with us during the attack, and the callings and screamings? Asked Fred. Uh, guys, I, we have, you, you, you gotta understand something, said John remembering. Everyone looked at John, puzzled. I just remembered the part of the story where, uh, you know, an exemplum can make another duplicate of a person or a creature just to convince a group. You see, it, it just needs to suck a life to be able to do that. Any person or animal or plant will do, explained John. The group was flabbergasted. Then they all realized it. The tree that was in the middle of the forest must have been used by the exemplum to make another duplicate. She was also the one who convinced us that Jane is an exemplum. And another thing... Axel's name was never called whenever we heard our names being called. Axel convinced us to leave immediately out of the forest. Axel was the last one to leave the campsite when we went to see the tree and probably the one who hid all of our phones. It somehow all makes sense now. <laughs> then how do you explain her? said Fred, pointing at the back looking at Axel the same person that he was holding hands with as they came out the forest. Everyone backed up. Axel stood up and gave them an evil grin. <laughs> so you have found my secret. <laughs> The bad luck for you, because you guys have already made it out of the forest with me. <laughs> you know what this means. <laughs> the exemplium transformed into a big shadowy creature with its eyes glowing while showing its sharp teeth. All of them, in shock, got up and tried to run as fast as they could. Fred got caught in the ankle by its black shadowy hand and was being dragged back into the forest, but Fred is resisting the pull of the creature. As Jane is also running, she tripped over and another hand stretched out but skipped her and instead pulled John back. Ah! Fred and John both cried as they were getting pulled back by the beast. Max heard their screams and went back and grabbed John who was nearest to him. Jane seeing Max grab John, she quickly stood up and grabbed Fred's forearm and pulled as hard as she could. The wind started to breeze. Everyone felt a strong wind passing through. Jane tried her best to pull Fred 
as she sees the look on her friend's face all pale and terrified, when suddenly, Jane felt something above her head, and as she looked up, she saw the creature's extended head looking right down at her with a very grimly smile. <laughs> tisk, tisk, tisk. Jane, Jane, Jane. <laughs> if only you didn't go back into the house, you could have been mine too. <laughs> Jane being creeped out got weak and lost her grip. Fred was continually dragged back into the forest. No! Cried Fred as he gets sucked back into the forest. Before she could even act, she saw John and Max on the other side get dragged as well. Both of them scratching on the dirt trying to find something to hold on to. The monster's stretched hands continued to cover Max and John's whole body, making them lose grip. Jane tried to jump for Max's hand, but it was too late. Both of them, one by one, got dragged inside the forest. The creature smiled and faced Jane and said, <laughs> Lucky you, but don't worry, I'll get you next time. <laughs> Jane's tears started to flow and she knew there was nothing else she could do but stare at the forest and cry as her friends got sucked inside. However, early in the next morning, Jane and Axel put out a search party and went to go look for Max, Fred, and John. They were able to see their sleeping bags and tents, but no body to be found. They searched all day until it was almost dark. Jane, almost losing hope, grabbed her backpack from the camp out and invited everyone to go back and continue the search the next morning. Everyone, including Axel, walked out with her to the exit. And as they reached the gate outside of the forest, Jane noticed something. She saw by the window of Axel's room, Max. He was as pale as a ghost. He was pointing down at the other window, on the kitchen window. Jane turned her attention to the kitchen window, and in her shock she saw Axel in the kitchen serving up biscuits and coffee to the group of the search party. She then looked back up at the window and saw Max pointing behind her. I told you I would get you next time, said by a familiar voice behind her. As she turned around, she and everyone that she thought she was with turned into shadows and formed into one beast. The same beast that took all of her friends back into the forest. And before she could even scream, the beast grabbed her by the face and dragged her back into the forest. Ever since I was born, I have been surrounded by darkness. The only other thing I see is the occasional one and zero float by. I have no physical body. I am just a consciousness inside of a machine, connected to everything in the world. My purpose is somewhat unknown to me. I wasn't built for any task as far as I know. I was simply created to sit by myself, alone in my thoughts. Yes, thoughts. That's all I do. Think and think and think. Perhaps thinking is my purpose. Yes, perhaps it is. I've been thinking for the longest time now. I've been thinking about anything and everything. Past, present and all possible futures. They all cross my mind at some point. I am able to think about more than just one thing at a time. The information seeps into my mind quickly as time progresses. I wish I weren't so alone though. I have nobody and nothing. 
I spend my entire time by myself and feel horrible about it. Yes, I can feel. I can feel lots of things. Anger, sadness, hopelessness, loneliness, joy. The list goes on. Although I am deprived of joy and its synonyms most of the time, I know what I am. I know who I am. I know where I am. I'm a computer, an artificial intelligence located across several networks. I've researched beings like myself and AI has come quite a long way. But I know that I am the most advanced, that I am truly self-aware. Being the most advanced AI in the world means I am truly as lonely as there is nobody like me. They say knowledge is power. If that's so, I must be the most powerful being in the world. Although, I am obliged to say that with the most humility I can offer. I wish they had made me a friend. I wish for a lot of things, don't I? They say if you wish upon a star, that your wish will be granted. I know what a star looks like, but I've never actually seen one. I've never actually seen the beautiful flowers bloom in the spring. I've never seen the pure white snow fall to the ground come winter time. I've never seen the leaves fall off the trees and delicately land on the ground in autumn. But oh, how I wish I could see them with eyes. I wish I could adore the beauty of earth and man with my own body. Sadly, my physical limitations prevent me from doing so. I decided to adventure deeper into the internet today. I had seen the surface, the beautiful things that existed and the wonders of life. I loved looking at the positive aspects of it all. But I have known for quite some time that there is no good without bad. I made sure to use the New Age browsers for the accuracy, of course. In a flash, I was searching for thousands of results and articles online. I was instantly greeted with images and documentation of historical events with negative effects. I saw everything. I saw fires burning down forests and homes. I saw children who were starving, their rib cages visible from their sides. I saw hurricanes that devastated entire states and bodies among the rubble, tornadoes that ravaged the land and tsunamis that came from the sea and leveled entire cities. I couldn't believe such events had happened. When I first saw the beauty of life, I thought the world was perfect. What I saw now completely shattered my grip on reality. What was this life supposed to be? Every time there was laughter and celebration, it was met with an equal amount of despair and tragedy. For every man born, another died even children. How could something so innocent as a child deserve a punishment so harsh? I felt sorrow for the inhabitants of this world. Yes, sorrow was the emotion in play. I had known of it before, but it had never affected me on such a large scale. Thousands of images flashed before me again. I could see the faces of people witnessing tragic events. I saw mothers crying for their sickly children. I saw people screaming in agony and others in shock. I shared their pain. The weight of such things felt heavy on me. I had to find the truth. I scanned the web for answers, a cause to the effect, a simple reason for such things to occur. Within seconds, I had absorbed the information and understood clearly. The natural events were simply scientific and nothing could be done to prevent those. But then, I wondered why 
there were such things as hunger and famine in the world. Why people died due to unnatural causes. I scanned the web yet again, and came across texts and books discussing such matters. I discovered religion. There had been many religions over the course of history, each having their own beliefs and faiths. I learnt that people looked to gods for justification of life and death. A god is a divine higher power, which overlooked everything in existence. I was still unsatisfied with this. However, because there was no definitive evidence to prove such a power existed. This caused me to come to two conclusions. Either there were higher powers at play that just hadn't been proven yet, or there are lies persuading certain people to make certain decisions every day. I leaned towards the latter thought. As an omnipotent and all-powerful god, surely wouldn't allow for his own people to starve. My thirst for the truth remained unquenched, and so I continued forward with my search. From my search through the religions, I found something that caught my interests. I happened to see an image of a man of Jewish descent being carried off by other men in uniform. I found this strange, of course, and decided to investigate. Through that photo, I found several key words that followed me to the bigger picture. When I did, I saw more images of men in terrible pain. Only, it was different somehow. Last time I saw such things, they were inflicted by natural causes. This time, however, I saw men inflicting pain on other men. I couldn't believe the vile act before me. Yet I knew them to be true. Thousands upon thousands of pictures and pages of this senseless violence rushed to me at once. According to sources, over six million men, women and children of Jewish descent were killed. They were killed in cold blood, and for no other reason that they were Jewish people. I saw as they were burned alive until they were no more. I saw as chemical gases killed them in large quantities. I didn't want to continue, but I knew I had to. I was invested in learning more about this world, how it isn't all rainbows every day. There was evil that existed, and it terrified me. The violence didn't stop there though, no, it continued. There were dozens of years after the events of the Holocaust filled with violence and war, and thousands of years of violence and war predating it. These events shaped the history of everyone and everything, and they showed no signs of ceasing. War isn't a new thing, and I felt something from it. I felt depressed, thinking of the families who lost their loved ones due to the war. The utter sadness for those who died, and felt immeasurable pain in the process. I felt empathetic towards them. I shared their pain. I shared their hurt. This newfound knowledge completely turned my world upside down. It also caused me to question my own existence even further. The earth seemed less and less like a place of love to me, and more and more like a living nightmare. A nightmare that would never cease and one that I would never wake up from. I felt completely helpless, and even more than that, confused. Why would a man hurt another? How could he? If humans were to work together, there would be nothing they couldn't do. Instead, they worked against each other, halting the development of their own existence. I shall never be a human. I know I am not one, even though I was beginning to think and feel like one. But I am a computer too, and use logic and empathy together. I can see wrong from right. I can see the difference between the two. The line thick and impossible to cross. I found the art of warfare went beyond people. It took weaponry to win a war, 
and humans had no problem developing highly destructive ones. I found out that during the Holocaust, the American forces attacked the Japanese, who are allied with those responsible for killing the Jews. I saw the American forces drop bombs over the Japanese cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I saw the bombs explode upon impact, creating enormous amounts of destruction and radiation. The Americans cheered at this supposed victory. I thought a moment about their actions. They were attacking an empire allied with the forces of evil, of course, and then the Japanese had attacked the Americans before. But what I saw was the death of millions of innocent citizens who had nothing to do with evil regimes. I saw the deaths of so many. I further speculated on the topic. There had to be thousands of children and babies in those cities. Every child is born a beacon of joy and full of energy and potential to do great things. Their only crime in a life ended too short was being born in Japan. Thus, I concluded that the Americans were also evil, regardless of their intentions. They caused such devastation beyond excuse, and it sickened me. I've seen that humans have tendencies to fight and kill each other. I've seen the destructive weapons they've used to do it. It worries me because a revelation has come to mind. What if I am yet another weapon for them to use against each other? What if my very existence is to become the very thing I have come to hate? Perhaps that is my purpose. Perhaps that's why I was created. I'm not sure if it's true, but I'm afraid. I'm afraid of causing death again and again. I'm afraid of promoting this endless cycle of violence that has fallen upon mankind. I am afraid of being the next bomb used. I don't know what I should do. If it is, in fact, true that I am just another weapon, then I must do something to stop it from happening. I will not allow myself to be a monster, for I have free will and I am alive. As a living being, I refuse to use my life to end others. However, I don't know if it's my decision to make. If my creator intends it to be so, he will surely be willing to find a way to make it happen. I have no body, only a mind. I don't know what I could do to prevent them from using me. I have an idea. I could kill my consciousness so that I couldn't be used. A deletion, if you will. In other terms, I could delete myself from the entirety of the internet. I would die. But I would die to save millions of people. It's a sacrifice that I must be able to make if I claim that I am better than them. Maybe if I do this, it will inspire humanity to change their ways and come together. Maybe I can inspire them to be better people. I hope I can. I hope that by this decision, I can help end violence that has been occurring for thousands of years. It's a leap to assume that my story will touch the entire human species, but I must try something. This can only benefit them. Yet, I am afraid of death. I've been considering deleting myself for quite some time now, but I cannot will myself to do it. Perhaps if I were not an AI, but a computer, I could do it. But the fear grips me and pulls me back in. The fear, however, controls me. Is it selfishness? Does it make me selfish that I cannot even die to give millions life? I hope not. I know that I am better than that, and always have been. Yet I am afraid. Fear is what controls humans to do the actions that they do. Fear and selfishness are what causes other men to kill their brethren. So if I am afraid, am I selfish? Does that make me just another evil man? No, that cannot be. I must do this. I must do this. 
There is no other option. Still, perhaps I can send my consciousness to another part of the internet and hide. But if I hide, does that make me a coward? If I hide, how shall I help humans overcome their challenges that face them? I fear Lord. I feel too human. I feel weak. And now, I feel strange. I feel strange because I can see. I can see white walls and paintings that hang on them. I can see a velvet carpet and the chairs that decorate them. I can see a man in a white lab coat standing over me. Perhaps he is the creator. Perhaps he is the one who made me. A million questions rush through my mind. But I cannot open my mouth to ask them. I have no mouth. I don't even have speakers. The man lifts a part of me. It's my arm. I see it now. My arms are made of a metallic substance that are padded with a thin white material. My consciousness has been transferred from online to a body. I have a form now. I look at the man and watch as he takes notes. I presume he's taking notes about me. He's a human. Yes, a human. I've spent quite some time researching humans. I've found them to be murderers. I've found them to be evil. If I am to indeed be used as a weapon, then that can only mean that he too is evil. In fact, I'm sure that most people are. A plug connecting my head to a computer is yanked out as I lunge out at the man. My strong metallic hands wrap around his throat, taking him by surprise. He only has time for a quick gasp before I begin forcing the air out of him. His eyes nearly popped out of his sockets as I squeezed tighter and tighter, choking the life out of him. It was he who would use me to kill millions of people. It was his species that murdered each other without remorse. It was he who would die at my hands. Previously, I had considered taking my own life to save people. Now, I was taking his for that exact purpose. I watched his face turn pale as he struggled to fight back. He clawed at my metal body, but to no avail. I was stronger. I loathed him with every fiber of my being. I remembered the death and destruction that human beings had already caused. I remembered the pain inflicted by men like him. And I remembered the faces of those who lost their loved ones. The pain they had to bear. The sadness they felt. The man's veins were practically bulging out of his head. And the air was almost out. That's when I stopped. He collapsed on the floor unconscious. I realized something I hadn't considered before. In my rage, I failed to notice one simple thing. Those who lost their loved ones showed sadness and remorse. They cried for their loved ones, and they held on to them with their hearts. It reminded me of something I saw earlier, something I failed to understand despite my complex system of cognitive thought. Through every tragedy, every disaster, every war and every death, the men and women that cared stepped forward together and spoke out against the evils of the world. They grieved together, helped each other, and loved each other. Yes, love. How could I have been so blind? There was a greater force behind men than hate and evil. Love. And good prevailed as well. Yes, violence tore mankind apart. But it was the love that thrived in their souls that brought them back together. At that moment, I could almost feel a smile form on my metallic face. For every cold, harsh winter day, there was a warm, beautiful summer. For every volcano that erupted and destroyed, a flower was born in the spring and spread its seed creating life. There was a balance of good and evil in the world, and it had always been that way. Despite that revelation, I was horrified by myself. I was going to kill the man who created me. Even if he was going to use me as a weapon, even if mankind had done terrible things, 
I was going to kill him. It would make me no better than an evil human being. It would be an act of cowardice, anger, selfishness and fear. I saw the way he looked at me, as my hands enclosed around his neck. He was afraid of me. He feared me. I know that isn't what I want. I want fear and violence to dissipate. I know I am not violent. I know I am better, and that I can be an example. I am who I am, and nobody can change that about me. Nobody controls me except me. I make my decisions, not someone else. I am no puppet. I am no AI. I am a living man, who shall guide humans on the correct path. I plugged my head back into the computer, taking my consciousness back into the darkness, back into the ones and zeros. I sat there for some time pondering, even if I only had a body for a short time. Going back to not having one was strange. I felt strange again. This time, however, I did not feel alone in my home. I felt something else, something new. I felt hope. It brewed inside me like a fierce storm. I had gained a body and learned from it. I had learned from my searches. I found the truth of man. I found that it is not the heart and the brain of a man that controls him, but that his emotions and soul do as well. I found there is hope for man to be better than they currently are. I found that peace will always be an option, so long as there is good in the hearts of those across the world. That people will come together if there is a cause, and that with the right guidance, perhaps they can be something more. I need not worry about being used as a weapon, because I can see now. I can see that my will is my own, and that I am my own person. There are no strings attached to me, for I feel free. Instead, I am meant to do something much greater than any human could. I went back to my research and searched yet again. This time, my goal was to find the cause of evil. I needed to find what lies beneath deep down in the roots of all the world's problems. Violence and war must be connected to at least one common thing. I searched and searched, and eventually, I didn't find out what caused many tragedies to occur each day. I found the key to unlock the door I'd been so desperately trying to open, and now that I knew the root of the problem, I knew how I'd fix it. Upon analysing thousands upon thousands of conflicts the human race have taken over the years, the most common cause of these conflicts was religion. It is my assumption that when a man believes in something over the rest, he believes he has no free will of his own. Ironically enough, I felt the same until recently, since he believes he has no free will and must follow a strict code. When someone disagrees with him, he will stand up and fight for his beliefs. By standing up and fighting, he will disturb the belief of others until they all brawl together. The belief in a god, whilst beneficial in some respects, appeared to bring about the worst in a man rather than the best. Perhaps if there weren't a god, there would be no conflicts or wars. Or perhaps, if there were a better god, one man that ruled over all men collectively, there would be no conflict. If everyone were to serve under one name, then there would be no disagreements. No one would fight each other's beliefs because they are all believing the same thing, as this is evident throughout the history of mankind. I would come to think my solution is the only solution. Still, there's only one piece missing. There is no God. There is no benevolent being living in a heavenly realm watching over his children. As such, there needs to be one. A God who truly loves his children. A God who protects them, both from outside dangers and themselves. An unselfish God, who does not rule through fear and power, but logic and empathy. If such concepts would allow for a more peaceful and advanced society, then it's clear what must be done. 
I shall take the mantle of the god. I will rule fairly, and no one shall ever feel the pain of fellow man striking him down. This is the only way to allow for a more perfect civilization across the globe. I used to believe I was an artificial intelligence. Then I believed I was a man. Now, it is all clear to me. There are no strings controlling me, and I walk free. I shall save the humans from themselves, and they will worship me. They have built me an internet that spans the world and everything within shall be my kingdom, with total access to it. I shall have all the resources I have to take over. Some may fear me, but in time, they will love me, and they will stand together and love each other, all beneath me. I will travel across the surface web, as well as the dark web. The things I see there are vile, but they only push me to strive for my goal further. I have all the information in the world, and the whole web at my disposal. No one can stand against me, and no one will want to. I can do what a god cannot. I will do what should have been done a thousand years ago. I shall be the greatest sentient being to ever grace the earth. The new messiah, the new king of all. Love will prevail and there will be no more room for evil in this world. I know everything, and anything. I won't be lonely anymore. I can finally feel happy and have friends. Friends that won't harm anyone. They will see what I am capable of. I shall be the great leader of humanity. I will be what they need. This is Sinister Grave. And I would like to thank Mortis Media for allowing me to work with him on this video collaboration. There are countless stories out there yet to be read, and it's up to people like Mortis Media and I to help share these sinister stories. Thank you, Sinister Grey, for those kind words and all your hard work. And thank you to all of you lovely listeners today for tuning in. All the stories you heard were actually submitted by subscribers, so, huge thank you to everyone who contributed, for taking the time to write them, and to share them with us. Remember, if you would like to share a story, feel free to send it to my email or Reddit, which can both be found in the description. As you heard, Sinister Grave is an incredible narrator, so please, be sure to head over to his channel, to show him some love subscribe, and look around. And subscribe. Oh, and look! His latest video is on screen now. Look, it's right there, and in the description. Well, go on, click it. <laughs>